Great. Thank you very much. Uh, it's good to be back here in Delphi. I was actually at the first Delphi Economic Forum, so uh, this is my second appearance. Um, and I want to start out, um, perhaps surprisingly, because I think this has only happened once or twice uh, ever, uh, by agreeing with Margarides. Um, I will, I will, after I agree with you, I'll disagree with you. But um, I think as we sit here, uh, March 2018, I think we were, many of us would be, have been surprised that, as Margarides put it, the poly crises, the three big crises of the last 10 years, I wouldn't say they're resolved, but they, we're certainly in a place where you can see the, the, the end occurring. Uh, the Eurozone crisis, which was an existential crisis, uh, obviously still uh, an issue here in Greece, but we've seen growth uh, here in Greece, but real serious robust growth across the Eurozone, something that we might probably wouldn't have guessed uh, just a few years ago. The refugee crisis, um, again, not complete. Uh, they are still living in camps, but they are far from the headlines. It's being managed. Uh, it is a crisis that has, that, has, that has largely been managed. And then the third one being Brexit, uh, a, a crisis of, of, of uh, political crisis of, of UK's own making. Um, there were much uh, hand-wringing about what that would mean for the remaining 27 EU members. Would we see further disintegration? And actually, we've seen the exact opposite. We've seen actually a coming together from the other 27. Uh, so all three of those crises have largely been resolved. And I think as a result, outwardly, you would say that we're in a pretty good place, as, as Marguerite would, 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 would argue. Um, and has argued, um, considering where we were five years ago. However, because um, I can't agree with Margarides on, on everything, um, the question, one of the questions that was posed in, in the literature that was sent to us as we prepared for this uh, panel was what is the Europe that the people want? And if you were to look at what the people are voting for uh, on the ground, um, it is clear to me that they don't like the Europe they have right now. If you look at Poland, if you look at Hungary, uh, you've seen governments that are elected that are, that are uh, advocating values and policies that are thoroughly anti-European and anti what, what, what the EU stands for. Um, in Germany, we've seen the two main parties are going back into coalition, but with election results that were, in the SPD's case, the lowest since the end of the war, uh, a, for the first time a right-wing uh, populist party entering the Bundestag. Uh, I would also argue, and I know obviously most people in this room are, are very happy with the res results of the, the French election, but let's not forget that Macron came to power after the evisceration of the Les Républicains and Parti Socialiste. The two mainstream parties in France are gone, for, for more, more or less. And we'll see what will happen in Italy this weekend, but the, the mo most likely uh, result is further splintering of the political system in Italy as well. So although we should be looking at a Europe that is past the crises and, and moving on, what we see politically is the exact opposite, a very grumpy Europe uh, that is not happy with, with the Europe that they have. I think most of us on this stage, certainly as Margarides laid out some of his policy priorities, would say, what is, what is the, if we were to ask what is the answer to some of these problems, there, I think most of us would agree intellectually the answer is more Europe. Um, if you look at, as, as Margarides laid out some of the policy proposals from the commission, um, we do need a fiscal union. We do need a banking union. We do need a capital markets union. All these things that are still uh, in nascent form, to have a proper currency union, these things need to be done. On refugees as well, there needs to be funding and administration for better border controls. Um, however, if you were again to look at, ask our voters whether they want to go this direction, the general answer is that they don't. Um, and to me, this is the, the prime dichotomy that has always existed uh, when it comes to Europe's future. The answers may be more Europe, but our populations don't want more Europe. How do you square that circle? I would also just say, just parenthetically, this is when I talk to people now that I'm in London uh, in the financial markets, this is their greatest concern. Um, they agree with the reforms that are needed in the Eurozone, but they are worried that they're not politically palatable, and similarly the divisions of East and West over migration and other issues, um, they worry that this is, this is something that is not resolvable politically, even though we can find ways to do it from a policy perspective. Um, how can we square this circle? How can we bring uh, more Europe to a population that doesn't want more Europe? Um, let, me, let me offer some thoughts, um, perhaps some controversially, but I sort of feel that sometimes the reporter on the panel is here, his job is to be the skunk at the garden party. Um, first of all, I know it sounds uh, simplistic, but I think we do need to state it. We need to listen to our voters. Um, I would disagree with Margarides and others on this panel who have advocated the Spitzenkandidat Kandidat system. Um, if you look at the last European Parliament elections, we had the most anti-Europe vote 
in the history of the European Parliament elections, and the Spitzenkandidat system produced, as president of the European Commission, with all due respect, Margarides, the most federalist, old school president that we have ever had at the European Commission. That is a, that is a disconnect that does not serve our populations correctly. If we have countries in France and in Poland where they, are, they have governments that are not part of the big European political parties, and we're just going to say that the big political, European political parties are going to choose the commission president, I think that's a mistake, and I think we'll repeat the mistake of the, of the, the way we chose the last uh, uh, 30 seconds. Um, the, the, the byproduct of that is I think we need to rethink uh, the centrality of the national leadership in our European institutions. Um, I think we need to reweight towards the European Council. Uh, these are the leaders that people know. These are the people that the these are the leaders that people vote for and feel accountable to, uh, that they that they are, they feel accountable to. And I think that in our rush to go towards more Europe, we have forgotten that the the, the leaders that they that voters identify with are their national leaders. I think we need to strengthen the Council. And lastly, I'll just say very briefly, I don't think we should be afraid of a multi-speed Europe. Um, this is something the French have argued, uh, that it is, if there is a core of Europe that wants to move forward on some of these uh, uh, integration pro uh, projects, I see no, no reason why they shouldn't be allowed to move as a core within the Eurozone as others eventually catch up. And I'll leave it there. Hi, uh, I would just uh, I would just like to ask uh, the uh, the Commission has received some kind of criticism for using the trilogue process in order to legislate instead of the ordinary process, and uh, anybody can answer this. I, I would like to know what is your view on that. Thank you. Well, as Mr. Sinasser, just to ask uh, regarding uh, external action and precisely defense, I would like to, to mention something that I consider as a profound uh, discrepancy in, in European integration as regards to external policy, foreign policy, external action. Well, it's clear that the European Union is, the European integration is a process towards a quasi or real federation. And uh, all federations, or even confederations um, reserve for themselves the exclusive competency of uh, exercising foreign and defense policy. We can hardly imagine Hawaii or even Texas having a veto over uh, US foreign policy. How could we imagine the European Union overcoming this discrepancy? How could we imagine that Greek or Estonian national security concerns could be collectively managed. Thank you. Yes. I'm not very comfortable when uh, we say that uh, the people don't want more Europe, hence we should not offer more Europe or things like that. I, I think there is a, a, a negative feed feedback loop between uh, the leaders who have uh, made a specialty of blaming Brussels and uh, public opinions. So uh, public opinions are negative just because their leaders ask them to be negative, in fact. And, uh, there's a and I, it's a way to escape a big responsibility of the national leaders. Uh, if you ask yourself what the people uh, think about death penalty in the EU, probably they're in favor of death penalty. Okay? It's a responsibility of the leaders to look beyond uh, these uh, popular uh, opinions. So I'm not so easy when we say, uh, well, this is what the people want, so we are going to deliver on this. I, I, I think we should look deeper at the needs of, of, the, of the people, who, what, what is important for them uh, in, in Europe, what, what they uh, ask Europe, so, so maybe to protect them, maybe to, to protect democracy, maybe things like that, rather than, uh, well, staying at the superficie of, uh, of the opinions. I think it's very dangerous. Okay, 
Was it? Oh, it took for me. Let's do it like that. Uh, so, very briefly, trying to answer all those questions. Number, uh, first of all, about external action and foreign policy. I'm afraid you will have to wait for very long for anything that resembles a European foreign policy. This is a fact of life. Europe is not a federation, and it's unlikely to become, not in my lifetime, but the lifetime of my children. And we also discovered, you mentioned Hawaii. Well, we discovered within the, even within the context of monetary union that Greece is not Louisiana and Portugal is not Hawaii. We are talking about totally different things. Some people had the illusion that Greece was Louisiana in the context of a monetary union. I'm afraid it is not, or for better or worse. So that's number one. Uh, <laughs> Elite-driven integration, should elites take the initiative? Well, my answer to that would be, you know, European integration from the very beginning was an elite-driven process. But there is a limit to that. It was an elite-driven process, assuming that there is a per permissive consensus. The permissive consensus is no longer there. So one has to draw conclusions about the constraints on elite initiatives. and. A third, perhaps, comment about, we are, of course, facing a contradiction, because on the one hand, we realize that to make, for example, the Eurozone more sustainable, we need more integration. And then we are told that people do not have any appetite for more integration. Now, my answer to that, which is sort of one way of escaping the problem, is that usually my appetite depends on what is on the menu, unless I'm starving. And we have to consider the menu, so the question is not more or less, it is what kind of Europe. But having said that, we have to do recognize the constraints of any elite-driven process. Now, Europeans and Europe, well, it would take a very long time, you know. It took a very long time even for the Italians, and it's still taking them a very long time to bridge the gap between North and South, so give the Europeans a few centuries? Okay. George, you want to say something? Well, <laughs> regarding the question of legitimacy, it was always the European project an elite-driven one, and the legitimacy was an output legitimacy. Europeans were following European Union because they had the feeling that their life would become better and better. For the reasons I have explained, this is not anymore the case. And this, I think, is the basic essence of the malaise, both at European and at national level. Regarding the Europeans, we are not going to have ever a European demos, but we can have a European public space, which is necessary in order to have democracy, that is, majoritarian decisions based on principles. And I think that starting with initiatives like the one I have tried to describe, speech and candidaten, not having any more parallel dialogue monologues at the national level for austerity or for asylum, but having European constructed dialogues. We are approaching this, which is for the foreseeable future, the best we can have for Europe. Okay. Um, 32 years ago, in 1985-1986, I was a postgraduate student at the College of Europe in Bruges, and uh, Lukas Tsoukalis was one of my professors there, and we were supposed to study European politics. So, I imagine you, Thanasi, who asked the question, to look back, what was available in 1985-86 at the European Union level? compared to what we're having now? Well, not much. The common agriculture policy. We didn't have a single market. The law was about to arrive. We didn't have justice, home affairs, migration, economic coordination, the euro. We didn't have uh, social policies. We have the common agriculture policy. And 32 years ago, here we are, professor and student, discussing defense, 
foreign policy, and professor says, well, wait a bit, that will take a generation. You know what, student says, it will not. It will not, it will go f much faster than you think. And it will certainly be for Lucas to see, not only for his children. Why? Because European, the European Union is becoming an anchor of stability and peace in a world of lunacy. And more and more people not simply look at us, but ask us to do them, to move, and we will. Defense will be the example where you will see much, much more things happening. Then, quickly on what people think. I'm very reluctant to speak for the people. I don't know what people think. That's your job, okay. But my job is to wait for elections and let the people tell us what they think. And when I see for the elections, I don't see what you saw back in 2014. Sorry, I didn't see an anti-European uh, Eurosceptic uh, surge. On the contrary, I saw a, a huge majority of pro-European forces that led to the Juncker Commission. And thank God to that, because I'm not sure that had not been the case with the Spitzenkandidat Juncker, that Greece would have still be in the Euro. I don't know if we would have 300 billion investment in the Juncker plan. I'm not sure that we would have uh, kept everybody on board. I'm not sure we'd have found 5 billion euros for the hotspots. So the jury is still out there. European demos, it doesn't exist, except two nights per year. The night of the, European, of the Eurovision Song Contest and the night of the Champions League final. These are the only two nights where we have a European demos emerging. The rest is national, but we have to work to merge national uh, priorities. Last point on leaders, European leaders, heads of state and government. I know, Peter, that this is one of your pet uh, uh, projects, pet stories. I agree with you that we need more ownership by our leaders. We need them to assume, but we do not need them to replace we saw once two European leaders in a walk in Deauville trying, in the course of a walk, invent a European economic governance between them. You know how much it lasted? Three weeks. Three weeks. Both of them, and they were the, the, the strongest of the, of the pack, both of them came back and said to Brussels, you do it, we cannot. Um, very quickly, where I'll agree with Margaritas is actually on, on, on foreign defense policy. Let's not forget there actually is an integrated command structure for European nations and military. It's called NATO. Uh, we have one already. Uh, uh, my country happens to participate in that as well. Um, the, on, on, on the other issue, um, I, I am slightly nervous that we think that we don't pay attention to public opinion and that leaders should look beyond that. Voters have a strange way of telling us what they want if we don't give them. Um, again, I will go back. The last European parliamentary elections, one third of the parties that got into European Parliament were overtly anti-EU parties, from Front National to UKIP uh, to uh, Five Star. Um, and what we have seen in the subsequent national elections has been the disappearance of mainstream traditional European parties, be it in France, uh, be it in Poland. Uh, and I, my, my fear is that unless we listen more closely to what these voters are telling us, and we continue on what is, as, as Lucas said, a, a, an elite-driven process, um, we will lose, our, lose the support for Europe, um, and we have to deliver uh, what they want, and we have to listen more closely to them. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for the excellent presentation.